I want you to open your Bibles to a, a familiar text, and that is in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to begin with two beloved verses there, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. And there we read, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Today, let's brag about Jesus. Amen. There are insufficient words to describe how marvelous the Lord Jesus Christ is, especially to the person who has come to know him as their savior, as the forgiver of their sins, the one whose blood washed the, the stain of their sin away when they trusted him by faith. Our songbooks are nothing but collections of love songs to the Savior who loved us first and died for our sake on the cross of Calvary. And uh, for our justification of the justification of our souls and the removal of our sins from our uh, eternal record. Thank God for that. And uh, when God doesn't, he doesn't just remit the sins like a, a cancer patient's a disease in remission. He removes them and um, cleanses that person from that sin. And the hope of eternal glory with him is ours to be clothed and covered with the perfect righteousness that only he's worthy of. And yet he's willing to impart it to us and place it upon us. Uh, the words in verse 6 that are each capitalized are summaries of who Jesus is uh, and what he represents to mankind. He's called counselor. Do you need wisdom in life? Then study the life of the Lord Jesus. Study the word of God. He's called the mighty God. The cults don't like that one. I talked to a Jehovah Witness man one time and I asked him to open his Bible to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. It says there, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And I asked him, what does Alpha and Omega mean? And he said, well, that means the first and the last, Jehovah. Then I had him turn over one page to Revelation 2 verse 8 which reads, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And I asked him, When was God the Father, Jehovah, ever dead? You see where I'm going with that. I'm trying to show to him that Jesus is Jehovah. And he mumbled something. Well, I think it's okay to, trans to call Jesus uh, Jehovah in some cases, depending on... He was making it up as he went. He had no idea what he was saying. But um, Jesus is the mighty God. They don't accept that. Isaiah also calls him the everlasting father. Mormons reject that. Hindus reject that. They believe in a, a whole pantheon of gods. One God begets another God, which begets another God, and so forth. And uh, so neither one of those uh, religions have any absolute mighty God over, that is supreme over everything. There are hundreds of other gods, thousands of them in Hinduism, maybe even millions of them. Uh, each god having his own little niche in the pantheon or the universe of certain things he's in charge of. The Egyptians were much the same way. Certain gods in charge of the weather, certain gods in charge of crops and harvest and so forth. And he's called the Prince of Peace. You know something? The Lord Jesus is going to solve the problem between Jews and Muslims one day. Uh, two groups that currently do not even believe in him. And he'll fix, he'll patch things up. Uh, number one, by getting rid of Islam. He'll get rid of that. 
the Muslims will be just out in the cold and just kicked out. And the Jews' heart will turn to receive him as the Messiah. Many Jews are doing that now. But it'll be wholesale once again when they realize how wrong their ancestors have been for centuries. But for the next few minutes, let's brag about Jesus and the ways that Christ is indeed wonderful. Let me read to you something. Um, it was an interview with Albert Einstein. And I'll read you the questions and some of his responses. A question, to what extent are you influenced by Christianity? Einstein, as a child, I received instructions both in the Bible and in the Talmud. I am a Jew, but am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Question, you accept the historical existence of Jesus? Einstein, unquestionably. No man can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. How different, for instance, is the impression which we receive from an account of the legendary heroes of antiquity like Theseus. Theseus and other heroes of his type lack the authentic vitality of Jesus. Question. Uh, one author writes that many of the sayings of Jesus paraphrase the sayings of other prophets. Einstein said, no man can deny the fact that Jesus existed, nor that his sayings are beautiful. Even if some of them have been said before, no one expressed them so divinely as he. That's from the Saturday Evening Post, October 26, 1929, a long time ago. But... I'm turning a page here. Let's consider the ways that Jesus is wonderful. Do you know something? I've said to you this before, but it bears repeating, especially those who've never tuned into any of our um, sermons on the internet and have never heard this uh, analysis before, but the American Ivy League of colleges, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Dartmouth, and a couple of others were all founded by the Church of England uh, and by Presbyterians in America to, to educate, uh, have an educated citizenry with special emphasis on training ministers, missionaries, and Christian lay workers. In fact, the, the rules of, I think, uh, Harvard in the earliest days required that every student read the scriptures at least twice a day and to be able to answer questions on theology and church doctrine if called upon to do so. And the same is true of, Colum uh, of uh, Oxford and Cambridge in England a thousand years before that. For centuries, those colleges were primarily instituted to teach the gospel and teach ministers how to present the gospel. The University of Berkeley, UC Berkeley, which is now a cesspool of liberalism, but it was started by the first Presbyterian church in San Francisco. And the minister of that church served as the college's first president. That became the flagship of what we call the UC California or University of California system. There's UC Irvine, UC San Diego, and others. And if you look at the, mod, the, the, the logo for the University of California system, you'll see a banner that reads, Let There Be Light. Hello, Genesis 1. The USC, University of Southern California, uh, the Fighting Trojans, was founded by Methodists in its earliest days. And uh, they were known as the Fighting Wesleyans, based, named after John and Charles Wesley, until the Trojan mascot was adopted. And um, the same thing could be said of multiple universities and colleges all over the world. Do you know something? The skeptical world, the critical world, the unbelieving world wouldn't know what higher education was if it weren't for the Christian church giving it to them in some form. We could add to that, I suppose, churches that say that they believe in Jesus, but they really don't know him. 
but the person of Jesus Christ inspires men. It in, inspires the hearts of men and instructs the minds of men. Jesus said, um, this is the greatest commandment, that you love the Lord your God with all of thine heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy mind. You don't give up your intellect and reason to follow Christ. You begin learning once you tr trust Jesus Christ. Before that, you're an ignorant blank. But think of um, Notre Dame. Even I, I would even I would even throw into there, and forgive me for saying this if some of you don't like it, but I'm going to throw in there even Brigham Young University. Mormons say that they believe in Jesus, and the person and the work of Jesus Christ inspires men to do great things. Loma Linda University, one of the um, Seventh Day Adventist College is based upon the inspiration of Jesus Christ. And great hospitals have been built based upon his inspiration. Baptists build hospitals, Presbyterians build hospitals, Methodists build hospitals, and Roman Catholics have about 6,000 hospitals around the world, all alleged, you know, ostensibly based upon the inspiration of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus. Where are the atheist hospitals? Where are the Jehovah Witness hospitals, for that matter? Where they are the agnostic hospital, where the cancer treatment centers based on Madeline Murray O'Hare. They're not going to be found. You'll never find them. But the person and the work and the life of Jesus Christ inspires the world. It moves upon the hearts of men and presses upon them that they owe something uh, to God and something to the world around them. And just take it in, take it in, take it in and die with all kinds of blessings having done nothing. That's the legacy of most atheists. They write pamphlets and they write books. They like to engage in public debates, but they don't do anything. They don't offer the world anything that inspires men. They don't contribute as the world needs. But first of all, consider this. Jesus Christ was wonderful in his birth. Wonderful in his birth. God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3, 15. That's the very first mention, the first anticipation of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ found in the word of God. And then later, Isaiah says, Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, he was wonderful in his birth. He was wonderful in the location of his birth as well. Uh, the city of Bethlehem, Micah 5, verse 2. 700 years before Christ was born, the prophet Micah had written and predicted the town in which Christ would be born. The time of his coming. He was wonderful in that. The time of his birth. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a man, uh, basically made of a woman, made under the law. And God waited till all the events in history had fallen into place as he intended them to. Uh, four kingdoms, beginning in the book of Daniel, the Babylon, and then the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire, uh, came in succession just as God predicted that they would. And in the, middle, in the middle of the Roman Empire, Christ came into the world. And the time was just right. The, the world politics were just set just so. And the time was perfect for him to come as the Redeemer of Israel. Jesus Christ was wonderful in his birth. The greatest verse on the incarnation of, of the Lord Jesus, 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto, the, uh, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then lastly received up into glory. But he was God manifest in the flesh. All the modern Bibles change that verse too. They don't say God was manifest in the flesh. The King James Bible is the only one that reads God was manifest in the flesh. 
That's why this is a Bible. Those are versions, right? <laughs> Secondly, let me say this. He was not only wonderful in his birth, he was wonderful in his life. There's that famous movie at Christmas time called It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. And it's the life of uh, someone who gets to see what the world would be like, excuse me, if he had never been born. D. James Kennedy, the late D. James, Dr. G. D. James Kennedy, uh, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida. He wrote a book called What If Jesus Were Never Born? How would the world's history and the events have unfolded without Jesus Christ? If without Jesus Christ, let me say this, none of us would even be here. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously there would be no crucifixion. There would be no Savior dying for sinners. There would be no Christianity. And without there being no Christianity, there would be no Apostle Paul to travel around the known Mediterranean world preaching it. And without Paul preaching it, there would be no influence uh, in the British Isles and eventually the, the, uh, the British Empire uh, to convey the gospel of Christ around the world over the next several centuries. And uh, there would be no apostles traveling uh, the other direction to China, India, the Apostle Thomas, they say, went to India as early as 49 AD, preaching Jesus Christ. That wouldn't have happened without Jesus Christ. And without the British Empire uh, expanding throughout the world and the schisms and the conflicts that naturally arise when men invent denominations and they quarrel with other denominations, there would have been no um, Puritans or seeking some place to worship uh, freely without the overreaching arm of the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church and so forth, uh, and then sailing, uh, setting, setting sail and founding this new colony or here in the, uh, this part of the world, there would have been no United States. There would, there would not even have been uh, Roman Catholic missionaries colonizing other parts of the world, such as South America, Mexico, and other places. Without Jesus Christ, none of us would exist None of us would have uh, ever been born. Our parents probably would have never uh, met each other. And all the events of world history would be different were there no Jesus Christ. He was wonderful in his life. He was wonderful at his dedication as a baby. Uh, he went to the, te or they took him to the temple as a baby. And uh, Simeon, the priest there in the temple, says, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. That's what the name Jesus means. Jehovah saves, or the salvation of the Lord. He was wonderful at his dedication. He was wonderful in the temple at age 12, when he was um, both asking questions and answering the questions of the religious leaders and the priests. And his mother came back, looking for him, saying, you know, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he says, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Luke chapter 2. He was undoubtedly wonderful as a young man growing up uh, in the household of Joseph and Mary. Let me read to you what another unbelieving Jew uh, nevertheless said about Jesus Christ. Among the great and the good that the human race has produced, none has ever approached Jesus in universality of appeal and sway. He has become the most fascinating figure in history. In him is combined what is best and most mysterious and most enchanting in Israel, the eternal people whose child he was. The Jew cannot help glorying in what he has meant to the world, nor can he help hoping that Jesus may yet serve as a bond of union between Jew and Christian. What does the modern Jew think of Jesus? A prophet? Yes. Crowning a great tradition, and who can compute all that Jesus has meant to humanity? The love he has inspired, the solace he has given, the good he has engendered, the hope and joy he has kindled, all that is unequaled in human history. And that was written by Rabbi H.G. Inlow, uh, Temple of Emmanuel in New York City, about 100 years ago. But sadly for that, Rabbi, Jesus was only a prophet. The Messiah? No. 
It's very unfortunate for him. But the Lord Jesus never had to clear his throat. He never had to apologize for having said something that might have hurt someone's feelings. He wasn't worried about triggering some social justice warrior about their feelings getting hurt. Um, he could heal the sick. He could raise the dead. He could open deaf ears and make them to, heal, to hear. He could open blind eyes and they could see. He could raise up the lame and help them to walk for the very first time in their lives. And he could honestly ask the, his accusers, John chapter 8, which of you convinceth me of sin? Not a single one of them. And they had nothing to say in reply. But he was wonderful in his life. Thirdly, let me say this. He was wonderful in his humility. Born in humble conditions. Raised by humble parents. Surrounded by humble people. We sing, born among cattle and poverty sore. Living in meekness by Galilee shore. Dying in shame as the wicked ones swore. Jesus Wonderful Lord. He said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He wasn't here to gain a following and collect money and build a big mansion for himself like a lot of the TV preachers are. Uh, charlatans, every last one of them. But uh, let me read to you one more quote. This is from an unconverted Jew by the name, a writer named Henry Greats, who lived uh, over a century ago in a book called The History of the Jews. He said his whole being was permeated by that deeper religion which contributed to the mildness of his face. He has made humanity honor. He has carried the highest wisdom to the homes of the lowly and the ignorant of the world. He has carried it beyond all barriers of schools and temples and for this only, he had to die a death of shame. The redeemer of the poor, the teacher of the ignorant, the friend of all that faint with toil and are oppressed with cares must die on the cross. Over the supreme tragedy, let the angel of sorrow spread his wings. Veil thy face, sun, be darkened, uh, sky. Let the earth tremble and men mourn in tears. The most angelic of men, the most loving of teachers, the meek and humble prophet is to die by the death of the cross. That's what an unsaved Jewish writer said about the Lord Jesus Christ over a century ago. But Jesus was wonderful in his humility. He, the, the creator, think about this, the creator entered into his own creation and was subject to the daily cares and toils of life that uh, men are subject to. So he could identify with men. He can identify with the sinner and what it means to be tempted. And yet the Bible says he was tempted without sin. Hebrews 4.15. Fourthly, let me say this. Jesus was wonderful in his compassion. The shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. John 11.35. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. Luke 19.41. Uh, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thee. That's because he knew the city of Jerusalem and the Jews, by and large, were getting ready to reject him. He said, if, this, if you had known who it is that's speaking to you and what he's offering for the peace of Israel, you wouldn't re reject him. But they were going to do so anyway. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. He wept over me and over you, if the truth be known. Hebrews 5 verse 7 says, With strong crying and tears, Jesus wept for the world. He had compassion on the sick and the lame. He had compassion on the woman uh, taken in adultery in John chapter 8. He had compassion on the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. She went home and told her and asked her friends back at home, is not this the Christ? She was convinced of it. And he had compassion on a six-year-old boy, November 5th, 1967. I'm so glad he did. Point number five today. Jesus is wonderful, was wonderful in his death. 
He had, his death had been figured in the Garden of Eden. God made coats of skins and clothed Adam and his wife in their nakedness. Well, some animal had to die for those coats to be made possible. Uh, his death had been pictured in the Passover. The Bible calls Christ our Passover, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. He sat down to observe the very meal that pictured him in type. That's why Jesus could say, this is my body, which is shed for you, which will be shed for you. He saved the repenting thief on the cross, Luke 23. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He provided for his mother uh, from the cross. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. John chapter 19. He saved the, that, that repenting thief. And he said to the father, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was compassionate upon and had a heart of mercy towards those that were murdering him at the time. Who could do that? Who else could do that except the lovely Lord Jesus Christ? And lastly, Jesus Christ, I'm going to conclude with this last point. Jesus Christ is wonderful in his power. Wonderful in his power. He had power over death. They said, he is not here, he is risen, as he said. Matthew 28, 6. He's, wonder, he's wonderful in his power to save. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. Jesus Christ is wonderful in his power to keep the Christian saved. Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Uh, for uh, 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. Jesus Christ uh, will be wonderful when he returns. He was certainly wonderful in his rising from the dead, which we didn't dwell upon. He will be wonderful in his reign. He will be wonderful as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's wonderful as the comforter when you're when you're lonely you need a friend he's wonderful as the one who inspires you to go on one more day and forget about yesterday's problems and start a new day once again he's wonderful at everything there's not a thing that jesus ever did or does now or will do in the future that is not cannot be summarized as wonderful wonderful that means marvelous without any real uh competition from any direction there's no one that can compare to him not a single person do you know something Jesus was wonderful in something that he didn't even do or rather he's wonderful for for a reason which he had no control of and that is this the coming of Jesus Christ into the world was marked by four letters B.C. and A.D. Before Christ and A.D. Latin Anno Domini, meaning the year of our Lord. Do you realize that every other religion is dated as to where they fall upon the timeline of Jesus coming into the world? They are all secondary to him. They're all subordinate to him. God appeared to Moses when? Well, about 1500 B.C. Islam, 640 A.D. Do you realize that Buddhism, the, so, the first biographies of the Buddha, were not written until 100 A.D. They say, oh, he lived five, six hundred years before Jesus. There's no proof that the guy ever lived at all. There is very little, if any, evidence that the man ever lived at all. His mythology. Most of it, what we, they say they know about the Buddha was mythology borrowed from the story of Jesus once Christian missionaries started reaching India and China. The Mormon religion, 
1830 A.D. J.W.'s about the same time, 1870, longer there. Every other religion is subordinate to him. They are subject to his authority. They're, they're lesser than the gospel of Jesus Christ, lesser than the person of Jesus, or lesser than the whole story of the coming of the Savior. He's wonderful in the fact that he dominates everything. It's good to be the king, right? You get to do things the ordinary guy can't do. And the word, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? Ecclesiastes 8, 4. And uh, he'll be wonderful when he reigns as king of kings and lord of lords. And I'm glad that I know him now. I'm glad. I, I, I feel so inadequate. I was talking to a preacher yesterday. And I said to him, God's better to me than I deserve. And he says, I feel the same way. He says, I fail him so many times. And he gives me another chance, time after time, opportunity after opportunity. He forgives and he cleanses me from sin. I say, that's exactly right. I had a pretty good fellowship with that guy yesterday. Thank God for that.